Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to today's Impact Session. We're so glad that you're here with us today. I am so excited to introduce our speaker today. She is a passionate woman who's an international speaker, and she loves talking about the love and freedom that she's discovered from God in her own life. She loves having relationships with people and really strives to be raw and transparent in order to empower other people to do the same. When you can't find her in her home in Southern California, you could probably find her in her home away from home, Ethiopia, surrounded by her over 280 plus children. Today, she's gonna to be talking us a little bit about the topic of her own journey, as well as her struggles with sexuality. It is such an honor and a privilege to introduce today's speaker, Kim Zimber. Woo. Okay. I don't hear 26,000 claps, which is good because that would have freaked me out. But I am just so honored, um, truly, to be here. Um, I know that it's not the same. I know that uh, it's a little different being at home, um, but different isn't always bad. And so I am so glad that you're tuning in. I am so glad that you might have not been able to make it in person, but you're here now. Um, and you might be here in six months from now too. So it is just beautiful. Um, and I also just want to put a little disclosure out there uh, that that bio that they read is, is beautiful. But if my like, brothers heard it, they'd be like, is that everything though? Because <laughs> it's not. You know, I think in these bios, they, they um, bring up all the good, right? Um, and that really is what God does with us too though. I think so often growing up for me, you know, I grew up Catholic, uh, third grade through eighth grade private Catholic school, um, two older brothers. So I was kind of a tomboy, which I, I think I kind of still am, hence the camo and the converse, but I don't really understand what tomboy means anyways. I always thought Tom was a boy, but that is, uh, that is still to be discovered. So anyways, uh, just growing up for me, uh, you know, I just kind of always wanted to be like my brothers and uh, I still kind of do actually in a way. They're, they're amazing men, um, but as a girl, I remember thinking it was a little bit different. You know, for me, I didn't have the same desires that a lot of my friends had, especially when I started getting into junior high. All my friends started having crushes on boys and I was more friends with boys. I saw them more as my brother um, than anything other than that. So I remember when I was young, like I started, well, it was actually even way back when my friends in like third and fourth grade were talking about what they were gonna, what they were gonna wear when they got married, all the colors of their wedding, all these things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I had no desire whatsoever um, to even think about a dress, let alone a wedding dress. And so I remember when I was younger thinking something was maybe a little bit different with me. Um, didn't really give it much thought. People didn't really um, unpack it too much and I didn't really talk about it either. Um, and so, I'm gonna pause for a second though and just break into something real quick because tonight, today, wherever you are, whatever time it is, um, I'm gonna share with you a part of my heart um, that isn't easy, but I know the Lord has healed and is continuing to heal um, in my own life. Um, and that has to do with homosexuality. And so, like I said, you know, growing up always felt a little different, didn't know quite what that meant. Um, and growing up with God in my life, it was a little bit hard when I came into my high school years and started to realize I actually had physical attraction to women. Um, I think there was some confusion in that for me personally because I was really drawn to certain women, whether it be you know, friends or whatever, or a, or a particular girl, um, but I liked who they were. I was usually drawn to women that were the opposite of me. I, I was kind of like just crazy, and so I was drawn to the more meek, humble, I was not necessarily humble. I, I still, the Lord, I'm a work in progress. Um, but in that, I, it, it didn't start off as a physical attraction. I could tell that, that the people were beautiful, that these women were beautiful, but it wasn't like this sexual drive. And I'm also gonna give a little disclosure for those who maybe don't like to talk real, I would just shut the thing right now because I don't know how else to be. <laughs> I don't think there's anywhere else um, and any way else that we should actually share. So for me, um, I'm gonna just unpack some things, like I said, that are tough, but I wish that someone would have talked about them personally when I was in high school, when I was the college age and young adult, because I think life would have been a little different. Um, it was my senior year in high school was the very first time I ever acted on my desire for a woman. Um, and if somebody would have stopped me in that moment and said, Kim, before you do this, 
before you do this, I just want you to know it's going to change your entire life. I would have been like, oh my gosh, my friends are drinking almost every night. They're doing drugs. One of my friends was pregnant her senior year in high school. I'm like, it doesn't really matter. See, I was craving intimacy. I think that we all are. We were created for intimacy. Um, and I was craving it. And when I was dating guys, I found that it was really hard for me to be intimate with them without going all the way. Like every single one of the guys that I did, not that there was tons, but there was a good amount and they all wanted to have sex. And so for me, you know, growing up in the faith, I was like, you know what? I think God actually got that right. That premarital sex was something that really was not good for me or the other person and that it was something preserved for marriage. And so um, it was kind of hard for me in high school to date, be, at least guys, because I felt like it got to a certain point and then we had to break up because I wasn't willing to sleep with them. Not saying that that was okay for me to now jump over um, to women, but it is what I did. I was craving intimacy. And see, the thing that I'm continuing to learn is that if you're hungry, you're going to feed on something, right? So I had this desire for intimacy. I had this desire for closeness. And I think our world has taken intimacy and said that it's sexual, right? We've, we've sexualized everything. And so for me, when I had this draw to this girl that was a good friend of mine, I, I instantly thought, well, this is sexual. Around the time uh, my senior year, uh, this song had come out um, from Katy Perry, God bless her. Um, but it was, I kissed a girl and I liked it. And so there was a lot of things going on in my mind. Um, not blaming that. I don't blame Katie. Uh, I take responsibility for my own choices, but it was my senior year in high school and I acted on the desire I had. I think it's really important to note that I had zero physical, emotional, spiritual abuse, at least that I'm aware of or my family's aware of. Um, I, I don't understand looking back on my past and my childhood, why those desires or feelings would have ever come. Um, I was not, you know, I, I know a lot of my friends, women and men struggle with pornography. That was not something I struggled with. I have always loved people. Uh, I, I just enjoy meeting new people. And so when this girl came in, I was just really drawn to her. Like I said, she was the opposite of me. Um, and I took it to a different level. I was craving intimacy and I went for it with her. And I will tell you, that night changed my life forever. Absolutely, you could tell that I'm not fresh out of high school. Um, and so there's been years in between, years in between since that one kiss. I would have never believed that one kiss would have changed my life, the direction. And, and you know what it did actually for me? You know, people could say like, hey, I have a craving for this or I, I want this. Well, you can't have a craving for something, in my opinion. You can't have a craving for something unless you've tasted it. You can think that something might sound really good and you might, you might desire it, but to actually crave it, you've had to taste it. And so that, my senior year in high school, when I kissed that girl, there was now a craving. She didn't kiss me, or my boyfriends that I had dated didn't kiss me like she did. And, and I'm sorry if that maybe makes some of you uncomfortable, but it's just real. And it, and it's, it was my life. Um, and so now I wanted... I started to actually see women differently after that one kiss. Now when I saw a beautiful woman, my mind went to something physical instead of just appreciating beauty, right? Like I can see a dog and find the dog beautiful but not have the desire to be with the dog. But now because I did something with this girl, I was starting to see women in a different light. Um, I'm not gonna unpack everything that I went through, but I will say I never told a soul. I never told anyone. Um, she didn't want to continue anything with me, uh, which actually broke me to an even, an even deeper level. Uh, our friendship was over. Uh, it was a, it was a one-time thing. So now I was left with this desire and this craving, and now my friend was also gone. Um, so that was really hard to deal with, and I didn't want to go talk to my family. I didn't want to talk to anyone. One, I didn't want to be labeled as gay. Two, I didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to just pretend like the feelings for women would go away. I wanted to pretend that if, or I wanted to believe rather, that if I just didn't think about it, it would all stop. And that was actually the opposite of what happened. Um, so for years, for years, I was dating guys on the forefront and behind the scenes being with women. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't a physical thing for me always. I loved the relationship. I love that uh, another woman could understand how I felt. She didn't think I over-talked. You know, all the things that sometimes guys are like zoning off, you know, it, it was just different. Um, 
and then you add the intimacy of a kiss or whatever else it might be, and now that bond, what I thought was growing us even closer, um, but it was actually just carving a deeper hole in my heart. Um, this went on for years, and uh, I did it on my own. I thought that God was upset with me. I thought that he was mad at me. Um, I had a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, and that's usually when you have guilt and shame, you hide. And that's what I was doing. I, I, I really believe that if I went to my parents, that they'd be like, Kim, you know, you're just called to celibacy. And God bless the religious, but at that age, I was not ready to listen about celibacy at all. And so for me, I, I already put the answer of what everybody was gonna say, I already had it. And so I was like, I'm just gonna keep it to myself. And so now, after about two years of doing this, I was just running around from one person to another, always one woman at a time, um, but they never wanted to be in that like committed relationship that I wanted, but yet I didn't want a committed relationship on the exterior because I didn't want to deal with what that might have to look like with telling and sharing with everybody else. And so it was really this internal war. Um, I had just recently wrote a book called Restless Heart, and that is not a plug to buy a book. That is just because it's exactly what my heart was. It was absolutely restless. I ran from girl to girl to materialism. It wasn't just homosexuality, you guys. It was everything. It was anything and everything that my flesh could go for. It was money. It was stuff. It was cars. It was uh, what other people thought of me, right? I was living completely on the exterior. And it was really hard because I didn't want to give up God. That was, that was one of the biggest wrestles for me is I didn't want to walk away from God. I didn't want to do what he was calling and inviting me to do, but I also didn't want to turn away from him and pretend like he wasn't real and that he didn't love me. So it was really um, a battle that I will never forget. Um, it wasn't until, well, there's a lot that happened in between. Uh, I ended up moving to Ethiopia, um, as Aaron had shared, and started a nonprofit over there serving widows and orphans um, when I was 23, sold everything I had. And um, it was there that God encountered my heart. I realized that I was not put on this earth uh, just for myself. I realized that whatever gifts he may have given me, few as they are, uh, are to be given back to him for his glory and for other people. And so it was then that my heart started to kind of get out of this selfish rhythm that I've been practicing so much. Um, came back, started dating this guy and uh, ended up getting married to him. And uh, there was a lot of wrestles in between, um, in between those years. And the book does unpack all of them. Um, but I did go to counseling as well. Uh, I went to a Catholic counselor and, because I didn't know what to do, so I hired the counselor on my own, said, I've got these desires for women. I know it's not right. And y'all, I got this message. It's not verbatim. It's not exactly what he said. But what I recall and what, what I remember in my heart and my mind was that it's okay, that God loves me. You know, it was really hard because I wanted to believe that. I knew that God loved me. That wasn't really a question ever in my mind. It was more, does he love what I'm doing? right? And so that was something I wrestled with. And when people would tell me it was okay, it just never settled. Though I wanted to believe that what I was doing was okay, it never settled in my heart. And so after years of wrestling and going back and forth, I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to be single all my life. I am not going to be a nun. So that leaves one option. I'm going to get married. And this guy that I was dating was phenomenal. Um, just a sold out lover of Jesus. And I thought, okay, this is it. Um, I'm going to do this. And I want to make it really clear, before I married him, um, I got on my knees the night before my wedding, and I said, Jesus, mark my words, I will never cheat on this man with a woman. It's a really weird prayer to pray. I didn't ask for God's help. I told him I wouldn't do it, because that was the desire in my heart. I wanted to be faithful. I wanted to be faithful. I'm not blaming my desires. You have a choice. We all have a choice, what we do with our desires. But I never asked for God's help. It wasn't even a year into our marriage um, that I cheated on him. And I cheated on him with a married woman. So um, you can't imagine what that does to a soul that um, desires to live for the Lord, but doesn't know how to deal with their struggles, their temptations, and who tries to do it on their own. Um, 
I don't want anybody to feel bad for me. I made choices. Uh, and then I, I had to walk out those choices with some repercussions. And um, I'm not going to unpack all of it, of what happened. But I will say that I, after that, after I got an annulment, uh, my husband did want to work on the marriage. And I just knew that I wasn't dealing with things, that I had really been running from a call, possibly a call to the single life, um, and that I let fear make decisions for me, that I allowed fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of being alone, um, all the fears to bring me into marriage, a calling that I, I don't believe I was called to. And so this was something I had to deal with, and I didn't want to drag him through it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a uh, proponent of, of divorce, um, and I'm not saying I even made the right decision. Um, but at that moment, I felt like it was, and I felt like it would have been selfish to actually uh, stay in the marriage with him when I didn't feel called to be married in the first place. Um, I, after, the, after the annulment, I actually started dating women openly and uh, was out, as they called it. Um, had a lot of talks with family, went back to counseling. My family did the most beautiful job of loving me while not loving what I was doing. See, I know that a lot of people, there's a, a phrase that goes around, love the sin or hate the sin. But I know when I was living in the lifestyle, when I was dating women open and out, that hearing that phrase, love the sin or hate the sin, it just hurt. It put my walls up. Do you know? Like instantly, it was like, okay, hate and sinner. Like those are the words that popped out to me. And, and keep in mind, you guys, yes, I knew a lot about God right? I knew all the Bible stories. I, I grew up in the faith with, with parents who radically loved the Lord, but my parents couldn't radically love Him for me, right? There comes that personal decision that I want to know Jesus personally, and so I, I didn't encounter Christ in that way. And so for me, you know, my family kind of dealing with me and walking through this with me, it was super difficult. It was super, super difficult to hear my brothers say, Kim, this lifestyle you're living is not of God. Like, He has better for you. You know, it's really hard when your, your two brothers are married, you know, and they're telling you that the lifestyle I'm choosing to live, and I, I remember telling them, I'm like, I didn't choose this. I didn't choose to like women. I didn't. I prayed, you guys, I prayed almost daily that God would take my desires for women away. Daily. And He never did. And so I would tell my brothers, I've tried. I've prayed that God would take us. I've tried to ignore it. I've tried to pretend like it's not there. I've tried to date men. I've tried, look who I married. He's, he's wonderful. I, I don't know what to do, right? To, to have someone who's married tell you um, to be single is really hard. I, I don't know. It was hard for me to hear, right? Where are the single people telling me that, that maybe weren't in the religious life, that were telling me that there's a joy that's still found, walking with Christ. And, and I didn't have that. I know my mom told me that Jesus is enough for you, Kim. And I said, really, mom, if Jesus is enough for me, then why are you married to dad? Now, I didn't mean that sarcastic. It was just true. Somebody telling me when they're married that Jesus is enough, but yet you got married. And her response, uh, as wise as she is, she said, because my calling was marriage. She said, Kim, you just need to trust Jesus. You need to just trust him. You don't have to but I pray that you do. So I still continued to date women. I was wrestling. I did not want to be in the word. I did not want to, I was still going to mass all the way through this because I did not want to separate from God. I did not. I was actually, I was actually afraid of how far I would go if I did actually fully walk away from him. And so I always had this pull back to him, but that free will, man, I'm so thankful that he gave it to me, but at times I wished he would take it away. Uh, it wasn't until I got cheated on uh, by the last girl that I dated uh, that, that the Lord woke me up. And uh, it was October 17th, 2014. And I said, Jesus, I surrender. I am done. I am done pretending to be God. I'm done pretending that I know what is best for my life. I give you everything. See, when I was 23, I moved to Ethiopia. I sold my house, my car, everything I had. But I held on still to pieces I held on to my future and I held on to fear. And holding on to those things, he can't have that, that fullness that he wants to pour out into, into my life when I'm holding back from him. And so I was holding back, but on October 17, 2014, I said, I give it all to you. It's all yours. 
because I'm making a mess. I'm making a mess of my own life. I'm making a mess of other people's lives. And I don't want to do this anymore. This is not why you created me. You guys, that was one of the most radical experiences I had with God. He came in in a personal, real way and touched my life. Now, I did not transform and become not human, but I told him I wanted more of him and less of the world. I started getting into the word, worship music, started going to daily mass. I was like, God, whatever looks like you, smells like you, I want it. I want it. Show me a different way, please. And show me that you're better than everything I've been doing. Every day since October 17, 2014, he has showed me that he is better. But not every day since then have I chose him. I would love to say, I would love to say that since October 17th, I've just been his, but that would be lying. It has been a struggle. It continues to be a struggle. But see, unlike my prayer the day before I got married, my prayer now every single day, every single day, is Jesus be my strength. You guys, I still have flesh, right? I still have desires. I still have temptations, right? If it's not for women, it's, it's prideful stuff. It's, it's whatever, all the things of the world, right? I need him every day. Jesus did not die on Calvary Hill so that he could be a one-hit wonder. This was not a one-time thing in my life where I experienced him and now, boom, magically I'm okay. And what I had to realize through a lot of falls, I don't even like to call them falls because I almost knew what I was doing, you guys. I would love to say I didn't know, yet to some degree I didn't. But every time Jesus has showed me how good he is. It says in his word that the kindness of the Lord leads us to repentance. The kindness of the Lord. See, I was always afraid. I wasn't excited for heaven. I was afraid of hell. There's a big difference. Um, I, I forget exactly where it is, but in the scriptures, it says that perfect love casts out fear. And the one who still has fear is not yet perfected in love. And I'm realizing today, as I continue to surrender my life to the Lord, as I continue to give him every desire, all these things that come or things that have been, that he is showing me a perfect love. See, I think when we have the wrong idea of God the Father, when we think he's angry at us, that we, we really don't want to run to him. I, I actually can't speak for anyone else. I'll speak for myself. I didn't want to run to him because I didn't know how good he was. You know, now speaking all over the place, um, I have a lot of people come up to me and ask questions, and, and I love it. I welcome it. I wish I had someone when I was struggling. I wish I had someone that I could go to and be like, dude, what about this? And just be real. No sugar coating, no, no junk over the top. Just give me the real stuff, please. I may not do it, but at least tell me the truth. And so this woman encountered me once uh, at the airport, and she says, you know what? I, I know who you are. And and Jesus loves sinners. He ate with sinners. I said, oh my goodness, absolutely. And he eats with me still every day. But he never once celebrated the sin. See, we, we want to be really careful, you guys, of turning Jesus into a hippie. And we want to be, at the same token, really careful of turning him into Hitler. See, he wasn't like, hey, peace and love, bro. Everything's good. We're all good. Let's sing together with a little, little guitar strum in the back is not at all Jesus of the gospel. And then on the same other side, he wasn't, you're going to burn in hell. What you did is wrong and you're going to burn in hell. There's a reality. He is just judge, but he is merciful, right? And so when we separate the truth and the love of God, we've actually separated the very fibers of who God is. And I'm telling you, we've recreated Christ and a recreated Christ, a counterfeit Christ, saves no one. I have no intention, when I said yes to coming here, I have no intention to hurt anybody's feelings, to make anyone feel like they are not loved, like they are not appreciated. But I also didn't come here to just pat you on the head and say everything's good. The kindness of the Lord draws us to repentance. God loves you. Whatever your struggle is, whatever my struggles are, he loves you, he loves me. You know, I used to think that how I acted would kind of regulate the heart of God. That if I did more good stuff, if I prayed more, that God would love me more. And that might sound good in our head, and it might work that way with some people in our human relationships, but I do not have the power, and neither do you, to change the heart of God. He created you, and he created me. 
and he does love us and we come into his family through the waters of baptism and we walk that salvation out through believing day after day after day. But I don't want you to think that you have to earn his love. See, I didn't run back to him because I thought he was mad at me. I thought he was upset with all the things I was doing. Jesus never celebrated the things I was doing, but he wanted to be my strength. And even today, he wants to be my strength with the things I struggle with. And he wants to be yours. You guys, there's so many messages out there right now. There's so many messages. And I just pray, I pray that if you are in the word of God and if you are in the presence of Christ and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, that you do not accept those counterfeit messages that will bring you down a very wide and well-traveled path. I went down at myself. I am not standing here to speak condemnation. I'm standing here as one sinner, one broken person, maybe talking to other broken people. That's it. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a beautiful saying, and I'm probably going to mess it up, um, but it's uh, somebody had said once that actually Christianity is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. You guys, we have a Savior who loves us, who loves us. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how horrible, how much shame, how much guilt. I've been there. I've been there, and I've even been there recently. But the moment you give it to him, the moment you place it in his hands and you say, I give this to you. See, my prayers all the way through, Jesus, take this same-sex attraction. Jesus, take my desires for women. Take this, take that, right? Yes, I know we have a God that gives and takes away. But real love is giving and receiving. And he promises in his word that whatever we give him, he receives you guys he died on the cross to take upon the heaviness that we try to fix ourselves. Please don't make the mistakes that I've made. Please, whatever you're dealing with, whether it be same-sex attraction, whether it be pornography, lust, pride, whatever the things, we all struggle. I am not. I told you that bio you heard, yes, that is the, the frosting. But inside that cake, dude, there's still stuff that the Lord is working out. But when you can be transparent and you can be real and authentic with the Lord, your life will be transformed. He will transform you. You will not transform yourself. We have the opportunity and the invitation to give our free will back to the Lord, to say, just as Mary did, our own personal fiat, right? Our own personal, your will be done, not mine. Whatever you want, Lord, be it done unto me. That is my prayer, not only for myself, but for all of you. I know that this topic, sometimes people get a little squirmy and they don't want to talk about it. You guys, as Christians, we need to be talking about what people are struggling with. If people are struggling with a candy addiction, then we best be talking about a candy addiction. If they're struggling with pornography, we best be talking about pornography. But my question is, are you willing to talk about all sin, not just one that someone else struggles with? See, as Christians, as Catholics, I think it's really harmful when we, we look at someone who might be living a homosexual, in a homosexual relationship and say, look what they're doing, that's so wrong, right? Now, we don't decide what is sin. That's the beauty of being a Christian. People are like, well, how do you know if that's sin? I said, because God already says what's sin, right? Now, I can agree or disagree, but he's already said what is sin. And so it's not for me to judge that person's soul, but oh my gosh, if I am more concerned about their soul than their smile, I would be having real conversations. But I wouldn't be like, hey, just get out of that relationship. That's sinful. I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I struggle with X, Y, and Z. Do you know how hard it is? But I have found that Christ is greater than any struggle. He was tempted in every single way and never sinned. We don't have a God who doesn't know what we're going through. He knows. And so can we humble ourselves can we humble ourselves and really meet people where they're at? So you may not struggle with same-sex attraction, but if you are a human being, you struggle with something. Are you will willing to be vulnerable? Are you willing to, to side by side with them and say, hey, this is what I struggle with? And not celebrate that struggle with each other, but pray for each other, intercede for each other, fast for each other, go to mass together, pray, whatever it is, but be real. See, let's not elevate homosexuality to the greatest of sins. 
when we have a lot of premarital sex happening, probably in your own maybe dorm rooms or wherever. And so in that, I just, I pray, I pray that the little bit I was able to share today, that you hear that God loves you, that Jesus loves you. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. I pray that we will reflect the kindness of the Lord with one another. You will not reflect who you do not stare at. If you want to reflect Christ, you best be staring at him a lot. We need, our world desperately needs, I need a beautiful reflection of Christ in this world. Do not minimize his truth and do not minimize his love. Keep his love and his truth tightly knit together because it's who he is. Let the Lord love you. I pray you let him love you. I pray you, you ask him for forgiveness and then you receive that and you walk in the fullness. You will still struggle, we all do, but join the club. Let's struggle in, in this narrow path together with the Lord as our strength, not yourself. I can't do it alone and neither can any of you. So I pray you're blessed. I pray that if anybody heard anything from my heart that seemed offensive, that you would trust that that is not my heart, that I would not stand on stage to be offensive. I wanna be real, I wanna share, and I wish someone would have done the same with me. Amen. Kim, thank you so much. Such a powerful story. And you've reminded us of the power of stories, of our stories, of your story, of my story, of how much God wants to first transform us and then how he wants to use this transformation to be able to transform the lives of everybody that's around us, to bring everyone that we know to the sacred heart of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you so much, Kim, for our, your honesty and for truly your inspiration. If you want to hear more from Kim, you can check out her book, just like she said, Restless Heart. Or you can look at her website. She has a lot of information about where she's speaking at next. She has a ton of resources if you are of any interest of any of those things. Her website is overcomemen.com. That's spelled overcome. M-I-N.com. She also has a Q&A button on her speaker bio right here in Mission Way. So if you want to shoot her a question, she'd be happy to talk to you. We'd like to thank today, our sponsor for today's impact session, Visually Linked Bible. You can check out www.dvgthegame.com backslash seek21 for a chance to win an Oculus 2 game headset. You can check out and visit their booth in Mission Way. So let's have a look at Visually Linked Bible. 